it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 478th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. He is right there, and he is not trying to confuse us by being invisible. Um, I was going to work on that. Were you? <laughs> Every uh, day I... I uh, do searches on the internet for news about energy and climate change, and I put them into my blog, geoharvey.com. And um, we do this show every week, usually on Thursdays, but today happens to be a Friday because the staff here at BCTV was... They just weren't here. They were at a conference in Chicago, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were very busy. Poor Helena is... You know, just kind of dragging her feet, going, you know, and down the office downstairs. Yeah. Because she's tired from a long and hard. This is <laughs> not a vacation. Um, anyway, we do this show. You can find a. Uh, you can you can go to geoharvey.com, g e o h a r v e y dot com. You can go down there that way, <laughs> and get to uh, a link that goes to a blog site where Tom and I do the show. And it also has a, um, there's also a file that you can download that has live links in it to the individual sh uh, items. Well, some of these things are very long and interesting and right. worth looking up and I'll try to call them to your attention. Yep. You go click on the link and they'll come up. Now, one thing I should say. Yeah. Um, People watching the show are going to know, I think for the most part, that the Supreme Court ruled, um, had an important decision regarding um, pollution coming from fossil fuel burning power plants. Okay. We're not going to be talking about that on this show. Because it's too soon. Yeah. It, we're, we're still in last week. We're still in last week, and this show just ends on Thursday... Uh, actually, on Wednesday, and the the news came out after the ending of the time that this was being we'll done. We'll talk but about it. We'll talk about it next week. We will talk about it. And as a matter of fact, I think, and I will mention this later in this show, there are reasons to believe that it's not as awful as some people say. And um, Time will tell. <laughs> time will tell. But, you know, you always say, Tom, it's all about the money. And generally speaking, we will be seeing about why it is that market the conditions, <laughs> mar market conditions are, are such that these, these po badly polluting power plants are going to be shutting down. Well, uh, market conditions, is, as I said, it's about the money. That's right. So let's go. Our, fir our first item, we have a picture of a Fella getting out of a FedEx truck. Let's see if I can't get that picture I bet up. you can. I bet you I can. There, there it is. Oh, come on. Where, where the heck? Your, oh, your okay. purse is too low. <laughs> there you go. There we go. There you go. It looks like a FedEx truck to me. It does, doesn't it? This is from Clean Technica. Right Drop delivers 150 electric vans to FedEx. Well, Bright Drop, of course, is a company. Right. FedEx and Bright Drop announced that the First 150 Zevo 600 electric vans have been delivered to facilities around Southern California. This would make uh, for one of the biggest deployments of electric vans to date. It's also the fastest GM brought a vehicle from design to market in its entire history. So Bright Drop obviously is a division of, of GM. Or, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Well, a couple of notes here. FedEx has a goal of zero tailpipe emissions right. by 2040. And considering all the trucks they run, that's an ambitious goal. Yes. In, 20, in 2003, FedEx 
was the first company to use a hybrid electric delivery vehicle for both pickup and delivery. And they used it in London. They only had one of them. And finally, FedEx has already installed 500 vehicle charging stations in Southern California. You know they're going to use this for something. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And they, they're planning on installing hundreds of them in every state. Yes. So FedEx is going to, well, they're, they're going into electric, electric big time. And yeah. It's the economy, economics. That's, that's right. Stupid. Okay, we have a picture here of children we in got Bangladesh. Some kids here, don't we? Yeah. I thought that picture was so cute, I couldn't. I just couldn't resist putting it up. <laughs> the, unfortunately, the, the the story is about flooding. Well, and there were, children are in Bangladesh. They're in Bangladesh, but that's not a picture of a flood. That's a picture of normal water. So, well, whatever. Whatever. Millions affected as deadly floods hit India and Bangladesh. This is from CNN. The South Asian nations of India and Bangladesh, home to more than 1.3 billion people, have, have been particularly badly hit by the rains, prompting some of the worst flooding in the region in years. Extreme weather events are increasingly frequent due to climate change. Well, uh... Bangladesh is the most densely populated area in the world, which is interesting. Extreme weather events have become increasingly frequent in South Asia, which we've talked about here, mm -hmm. due to climate crisis, with temperatures in parts of India and Pakistan reaching record levels. Well, in fact, temperature part in other parts of the world, too, but there's articles about India and Pakistan. Yep. The flooding was the worst in 120 years. Wow. In, in uh, Bangladesh and nearby Indian states of Meghalaya and Assam, four million people have been stranded by catastrophic flash floods. There's a bunch of pictures in the article about that. More than 36,000 children have sought refuge in overcrowded sh crowded shelters. This is not insignificant. No, it's not. Have you ever seen a flash flood? Yes, I, I lost a car in one. Oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> That was a flash flood? Huh? I was, I was going to school in Connecticut, and the school's on the Housatonic River, and the Housatonic River had about two feet of ice on it, and it broke up. And the ice produced a jam, okay. ice jam, okay. and the, the height of the river rose, I would say, probably 10 or 12 feet in a matter of about two minutes. Wow. And it was impressive. Well, I had flood insurance on my house in Wardsboro when I lived in it. Yeah. And a flood came down a river, and took off my back porch. Ah. And they wouldn't pay for it. It was the wrong kind of flood. <laughs> they didn't uh, insure against flash floods, only against area flooding. So I called up a nice, a good friend, Patrick Le uh, Leahy. Leahy. <laughs> and he took care of it. Ah, uh, wasn't that nice? He got it done. He's retired. In 2022, the IPCC, that's the International Program on Climate Change, said that heat waves and humid stress would become more intense and frequent, and that monsoon pre precipitation will increase. Yep. So we're looking forward to more of the same, if not worse. Yes, I think that's pretty definitely clear. Okay, the next item is from Clean Technica. We, we have got a, a picture here. We have a picture uh, of like solar panels that have been there. bombed. And well, that, it is, yeah, bombed uh, photovoltaics. That's a bomb crater in and the middle of the picture. There's a guy standing there walking out of the bomb crater. Look at that crater. Look at all those destroyed PV panels. Yeah. Well, solar okay. panel Solar power plants are more missile resistant. Yeah, probably all of us have seen them in the images of death and destruction in the UK, Ukraine. Every one has been heart rending, has been heart rending. But there are interesting pieces of good news that came out of the country recently. It has, it is the proof that it's pretty difficult to take out a solar power plant. Well, it's too distributed. It's too distributed. I mean, if you got one plant, one well placed bomb's going to take the whole thing out, but if you've got a whole field full of uh, these things, you can take out well, 50 of them or you can see whatever. where the bomb hit. And yeah, exactly. And this really kind of speaks also to, like in Sir Hurricane Andy, uh, Sandy rather, in New Jersey, there was a huge number of. Oh, I got of a picture of the, uh, 
uh, roller coaster than that. Yeah. On the, three quarters under water. Oh man. Well, at any rate, the solar panels, by and large, you know, something like ninety-eight percent of them survived. Survived, the right? right. So. Well, at first glance, the damage to the plants looks horrific. There are solar panels and parts of panel, so parts of them lying everywhere. Yeah. And a large crater. Yep. Then some. And then some. It looks like the bomb went off. Yeah. Largely because the bomb did go off. <laughs> Quite an amazing thing. <laughs> it was attached to a Russian ballistic missile that had been aimed at the plant. And there's an interesting video on that website. Yes. And, you know, this, this has me really upset. If you watch the videos of the Ukrainians, they will shoot a, a, a missile from a shoulder-fired yeah. launch. And the missile goes out, and then it goes up and comes down. And it comes down directly at, down. at a tank. Okay. And three feet above the tank, it never hits the tank. Three feet above the tank, it, it goes blows up. up. And that blows up all the ammunition inside the tank, which oh, blows, nice. blows the turret oh. off. So you have this turret going flying up in the air. And if you look at U Ukrainian missiles, that's what they do. They, oh, they yeah? hit the tanks, they hit the aircraft, they miss, but they come close if they miss. If you look at the damage that's been done to the Ukraine, yeah. it's apartment buildings, it's schools, it's churches, it's theaters, it's hospitals. It's, in, it's like the Russians either have got the worst missiles in the world or Something they're is purposely yeah. aiming them at... The, at civilian targets in order to terrorize everybody. Well, one key thing we can learn from this missile attack is how robust and resilient solar power generation yeah. really is. Yeah. If this had been a coal or a natural gas plant, it would have little been or no them. electricity would be able to come from the plant for weeks or months. Yeah. Yep. Okay, our next Let's item... up to the next one here. Here is... Um, we've got a picture of... Cooling um, towers. Huh? That's cooling, cooling towers. towers. Yeah. Well, actually, it's a nuclear plant. There's, there's well, a couple. So, yeah, it's got uh, two reactors. Yeah. This is from the Indian Express, but it's about Germany. Well, that's good. That's the Gundremagen nuclear power plant <laughs> in Bavaria. Okay. What? Could Germany keep its nuclear plants running from the Indian Express? As Germany seeks to fuel its economy and ward off a recession considered likely if faltering Russian gas supplies stop entirely, some are calling for nuclear plants to stay open. Utilities say constraints on sourcing fuel rods and expert staffing make that impossible. Well, following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, Germany has reduced its share of Russia in its gas imports to an estimated 35% from 55%, but it is still dependent on it, mm -hmm. okay? Every domestic energy source, including nuclear power, is under consideration if Russian gas supplies stop completely. Yes. So Europe your could be in trouble. Well, in Germany, what's happened is they've got three nuclear power plants. They're all scheduled to close in December. By the end of this year. That that goes back years. They've been planning this for years. They, they, um, and I think that one of the one of the things that Vladimir Putin had in mind when he, when he timed the invasion was that he knew that the Germans would not be able to get these plants up and running again. Well, that's just what it says. Constraints in sourcing fuel rods. It takes about a year, year to a make year and a half. Keeping them open impossible. Yep. It takes a year to a year and a half to get fuel rods once you've ordered them. And they haven't ordered And the them. staff has already committed itself to going other places. Okay, our next item, that by the way was from CNN. Our next item is from Clean, whoops. It's from Friday the 24th. What am I, where am I? Oh, there we are. It's nice that, here this can... is from CNN. That previous one was from Come the Indian you. Express. To, uh, we have we a picture of a natural gas pipeline ship which I went out and found for this. Interesting looking ship. Got Isn't it? Hella, hella port on it. Got a little hotel in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Germany declares gas crisis as Russia cuts supplies to Europe. This is go. This parallels what we just yeah. talked about. 
Germany activated the second phase of its three-stage gas emergency program after Russia reduced the amount of natural gas it supplies. This takes Germany one step closer to rationing gas to industry, which would be a huge blow to the manufacturing heart of its economy. Well, Europe has been trying to reduce its reliance on Russian natural gas since the invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Germany has managed to reduce Moscow's share of its imports to 35% from 55% before the start of the war, but they can't do it any, they don't, can't seem to do it any more than that. Well, they, one of the problems is they've got contracts. That they've got contracts. Supposed to be filled. Well, Russia's state gas economy, which is called Gazprom, slash flows through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline to Germany by 60% last week. Yeah. So they're playing games. Yes. It affected 12 EU they, countries. They started playing games before they invaded the Ukraine several months The German before. economic minister said he hopes rationing wouldn't be necessary, but he couldn't, couldn't rule it out. Okay. Gas is in short supply. Our Germany, next... I'll finish up. Oh, go ahead. Germany, asked Austria, and other EU countries are now turning to coal and oil-fired power stations so more gas can be diverted into storage for heating homes during the winter. Right. So they're looking ahead. Our next item An is... An interesting picture here. A picture of a solar array in Massachusetts, and this well, is Well, that's in Auburn. Clean Technica. Which is south of Worcester. Worcester. Worcester, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Worcester. <laughs> yeah, that's what it actually is. And uh, there's another one very si similar to it in... Uh, I got the name of the town here. I think I do. <laughs> I can't find it. Well, do you have the title of the article? Two smart, S-M-A-R-T, projects from Agilitas Energy, bringing renewable energy to Massachusetts. Agilitas Energy, a developer and operator of distributed energy and storage PV systems, and by the way, one of the biggest around, announced two Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target program uh, projects in, uh, in its pipeline. They will help establish the Bay State's transition, accelerate the Bay State's well, transition. Well, one of them, as I mentioned, is in Auburn. The other one is in Hopkinton, and it's not... The one in Auburn is finished and operational. Okay. They're just about to start if they haven't started yeah. on, on the other one. Yep. It's going to have a six milli megawatt solar... milliwatt. Megawatt. Yeah, six megawatt solar array <laughs> and 10 megawatt hours of storage capacity. So it's not a huge plant. A six milliwatt storage <laughs> uh, solar array is what I, have on, much. Ha, what I have on my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Agita, uh, Agilitas is one of the largest Massachusetts smart program developers. And smart stands for Solar Massachusetts Renewable Targets. You know, I hate acronyms. <laughs> Some of these projects awful. give the company a smart project portfolio of seven ongoing projects with 50 megawatts of solar PV and 80 megawatts of energy storage. So they're getting on the, getting on the ball there. Okay. We're coming up to our, Saturday, our June next 25th. Item, that, this is a picture of a Hawaiian duck. How do you know it's Hawaiian? Well, I went looking for endangered species, and I found a picture of an, of an endangered species, which oh. was a Hawaiian duck. Well, and apparently I'll, they're I'll, native, but this is... I'll take your word for this it. It looks like a <laughs> Vermont duck to me. <laughs> it, it looks a lot like a mallard, but uh, this is from the National Audubon Society. Wildlife officials want to make it easier to relocate climate imperiled species. I was surprised this by this. This is an interesting story. Yeah, the Endangered Species Act typically allows species to be introduced outside their current range, but only within the historical range. Yes. For some species, all of that range is becoming uninhabitable. Unfortunately. New policy is needed according to wildlife officials. Well, they're looking at uh, bringing species to different places where they've never been before yeah. because their old habitat is damaged. 
Well, the, yeah, and the entire old habitat is yeah. damaged. Yeah. Yeah. So they got to put them somewhere. Yeah. Or let them just cease to exist. Well, there's a quick takeaway. Several endangered birds have already benefited from the current policy for experimental populations, which include whooping cranes, Guam rails, which I never heard of them, and California condors. And I read something else about California condors. I'm They're reading. coming back. Yeah, I've been reading about They're them. They're huge. Since, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> since I was, a, you know, in, in like third grade or something. They've all but disappeared, but they're coming back. Almost disappeared. I think they had fewer than 20 of them at one point. Yeah. Okay. These are big birds. These, these have a bigger wingspan, I think, than six feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, absolutely. I think they have a wingspan of like 14 feet. Or <laughs> I don't, <laughs> Whatever it is. They are gigantic. Bigger than mine. Yes, I think they probably well, we got are. a picture coming up of, Ukra of a Ukrainian, Ukrainian wheat field. field. This is from that. CNN. You want to be able to get that. The original there CNN story had a Ukrainian rye field. but Who it, knows about rye? Well, you know, I, I, I want to have all of our pictures be, uh, oh. be um, public domain or uh, share alike. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, you don't want somebody suing you for... Well, nobody's going to sue us for stuff that isn't public domain. But if this gets of copied, more to sue than they can possibly get. Yeah, the the if this gets copied, if the stories get copied from my blog to a commercial site, like Gr Green Energy Times, for example. Then, speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of which, you got an article in Green Energy Times that we're going to talk about later. No, I don't. You don't? No, it's in, oh. it's from Clean Technica. Oh, it's from Green. It's Technica. one I wrote for Clean Tech. Okay. Yeah. But you wrote it. But I wrote it, yes. Okay, what do you got for a title? World here? leaders are facing a crisis on all fronts. Putin will be watching if they fail. Yeah. As the G7 approaches, Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, Putin's officials are hinting at nuclear Armageddon. These people are mean. China is increasingly assertive. The global food crunch is on the way. Oil prices are spiking, and both global economic slowdown and cost of living crisis, crises are looming. And by the way, I think that the G7 people are really not interested in backing down. Um, well, G7 has more writing on it than at, than at past meetings. Yeah. Success will come in mitigating the crises, not stopping them. Yes. Okay. Failure is exactly what Putin wants. Yes. And, you know, again, the Ukrainians shoot tanks. Putin shoots libraries and hospitals. There's, this is, Big difference. this is evil stuff going on as far as I'm concerned. I mean, maybe somebody's pulled the wool over my eyes, but I don't think so. Well, nobody seems to really know what's going on with Putin, including Putin. I think that's a good way to put it. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, we got an interesting picture coming up. Here. This is a picture of a house um, lit up in a blackout. Of well, course, apparently they had their own uh, generator. And it's not lit up because of the lightning. No, they had a they had a battery. Well, okay, battery generator. Yeah. This is from Clean Technica. Tesla invites a new round of Californians to enroll in a virtual power plant. Yep. Tesla recently launched its new virtual power plant in partnership with Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which is usually called PG&E. The virtual power plant will power will allow Powerwall users, Powerwalls, of course, are batteries, to it's opt Tesla's product. Yeah, that's yeah. right. To opt into the program to help stabilize the electric grid and end blackouts in California. Well, this is interesting because Tesla's new virtual power plant is the largest distributed battery in the world. That's interesting. It's a distributed battery. There are some pretty big distributed batteries in Australia. I mean, I think the, the well, one in South Australia maybe had this guy doesn't read enough. Fifty thousand users. No, I think I think it's probably correct. I think there's probably more people in California than there are in all of Australia. Okay, we're up to Sunday. Well, June the article 26th. describes oh, PG&E's emergency load reduction program in depth. If you want to find out more about it. Okay. And then we go on to Sunday, the twenty-sixth. 
Yes, and we have a picture of firefighters. Is that what training. they are? I think they are. Look like firefighters to me. And this is from Clean Technica. It is. What firefighters can teach us about preparing the grid for extreme weather. Preparing for emergencies and preventing disasters requires planning, equipment, and communications. This is true for operating the electric power system in extreme weather as it is for fighting fires. For emergencies, firefighters and utilities both share resources. Well, today the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is asking how grid operators and planners are evaluating the risks of extreme heat, cold, and droughts, which are hazards that can cause system-wide problems for the electric power grid. Right. So they're looking closely at things that they used to overlook. Yes. And they're, they're stepping in to help each other, which they've been doing all along, really. So we got another picture coming up. We have there. a picture of a hybrid solar wind plant in Germany. Let me get that one there. That's very interesting because I'm looking at that to try and find out where all the solars are. And it looks like they're the ones in the low, lower left corner. Great big row of what looks like yes. solar. Yes. Because I can't see any place else in the picture where they might well, be. Well, those things that look like they could be, I don't know, on something on a road, I think is. And I think that they. Way back on the road, yes. It look like there's more of them on the road. You're yeah. right. Okay. I was trying to figure out where the uh, solar, where all the yeah, solar Before was we from. had a thing from Indian Express about Germany, now we have a thing from France 24 about Germany. About Germany. <laughs> Must be things are happening in Germany. Yeah. Energy shock tests the G7 leaders' climate resolve. Uh, by the way, we got the news from G7 is, is in Europe is pretty good in general, I think. You want to talk? Uh, they, 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 they've, well, well, we'll hit this again. We're going to hit it again. Yeah. Okay, talk, talk about I it. I believe then. we are. Uh, energy, you, know, you, you just read that. Leaders of the group of seven nations are under pressure to stick to climate pledges. Germany is in an awkward position as G7 uh, seven climate host, having recently announced that it will burn more coal to offset a drop in Russian gas supplies amid deteriorating ties over the war in Ukraine. Well, they don't want to do that, but they don't have much choice. They don't have much choice. I don't think anybody's getting upset at them. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think there are there well, are concerns are not growing in G7. that the gathering will push G7 partners to water down a previous promise to stop financing gas and oil projects. But you know, by the end of the year, there is there's something going on here that they're aware of, and that is. The, the the quicker they get off of Russian gas and oil and coal, the better off they are. And so... Well, it, they're between a rock and a hard place here. Yeah, so... The, if what they, they get gotta, off them, then they got to start rationing or stuff like or that. Or they have to put in a lot of res, renewable put in some energy. Water real quick. Real quick. Which, you know, that's not all that easy. But well, it says here, with renewables like solar and wind power, not yet a widely available alternative. Mm -hmm. Okay, countries are reverting to fossil fuels to plug the gap. Right. Which they don't really want to do. They don't want to. Okay, our next item... we got an interesting picture is here. ...is from Clean up. Technica. And what do you notice that's funny about that picture? <laughs> everything, in the everything in the back of the truck is uh, pointing in the wrong direction or something. Well, where there used to be a motor, there's a trunk. Yeah, it's called a frunk. A funk. It a is called that. A, fr a frunk. A frunk. <laughs> I don't like that word. I don't like acronyms and I don't like frunks. <laughs> Ford ends its leasing buyout provision for electric vehicles. Yes. This, was, this is interesting. This is really, in it's much more interesting than it sounds. It used to be that leasing a car was a way for some people to drive a more car than they could otherwise afford. One advantage uh, was that the person leading, leasing the car could purchase it at the end of the lease period for a predetermined price. But such a deal may not be available f at Ford anymore. Well, Why is that? The problem was that less lessors. Yes. That's not lesser. It's lessors. Yeah. <laughs> found they could make a handsome profit by buying a car at the end of the lease and then reselling it at a profit. Exactly. And the company wants that profit. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's all about money. Yeah. Do you have more about that? 
Well, ostensibly, the purchase of the lease is to aid our goal of delivering carbon neutrality by 2050. But <laughs> <laughs> companies like Redwood Materials can recover and recycle 95% of the chemicals and materials in an EV battery. Okay, so there's a good resale for those batteries, and they want them back. They want them back. Do you, the customer, own it? Or does the manufacturer continue to own it? Even though you paid the purchase price of the car when you bought it. <laughs> it seems we, the consumers, are only renting much of the vehicles we thought we were buying. Well, there are a lot of people who buy a car yeah. and they buy the whole thing except for the battery, which is leased to them. That's what's happening now because the yeah. battery is just so darn expensive. Yeah. But yes, you're right. The battery is leased to them. Okay. Should we go on, Tom? Yeah, we got a picture here of a vineyard. If of I a vineyard. That. That's what it is, I think. It's a vineyard. It looks like a vineyard to me. Incidentally, we're up to May, um, Monday, June 27th, I want to tell you. Yeah. Our cherries have just about all been picked. Is that so? By I, the birds? Uh, no, by... By my, People. People by my landlady, and um, I, I had a fun time walking out the door, and there was a chipmunk there eating a cherry. That's cool. And the chipmunk was not interested in going away just because I showed up. <laughs> so I got to watch this chipmunk for a couple of minutes. He was only about two feet from me. The cherries in my backyard are too small to eat. Yeah. They're just tiny. Yeah. But the, the uh, we have other things coming along, peaches coming along. Anyway, we, what we have here is a vineyard, and this is from The Atlantic. Well, this is the, this is the title of it. Full body with notes of Band-Aid and medicine. <laughs> this is a description of wine. <laughs> Vintners are no strangers to the vicissitudes brought by climate change. Warmer temperatures have been a boon to some in traditionally cooler areas who are rejoicing over ripe, riper berries. But scorching heat waves, wildfires, and other climate-driven calamities have more often ruined uh, harvests. Well, this is a very long article, and the gist of it is that climate change is altering wine as we know it. Yeah. Viticulturists want to know if they can harvest their grapes without the dreaded effect on their wine. The odious ashtray flavor known as smoke taint, the answer is maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's sad, but that unfortunately the grapes are picking up flavors from what's around. That's them. what's happening, unfortunately. And then you, the 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 band aid fla flavor and and that sort of thing are are things that happen because they just they don't um, they don't uh, f ferment. Well, what's Normally. happening is because of the season is changing, the nature of the berries that they're growing is changing. Yeah. And growers want a stew of secondary compounds to build up because these create the aromas key to quality wines. Well, a lot of the aroma. And they're not getting yeah, what they expect. But uh, gra uh, the, the yeast that ferments these things op produces off uh, flavors if they ferment a little, just one or two degrees too warm. Well, that's what the article basically says. Yeah. That this is very, very touchy. It's it's not. Uh, it's something that you've got to be careful of. Okay, we are moving to Monument Valley. Let's move along to Monument. And this Valley. is an article from Clean Technica. Yeah, Monument Valley is it's a cool place. It's it's on a <laughs> intersection of four states. Yes, Arizona. California, uh, Utah, and New Mexico. And it's the only four-state intersection in the United States. Okay. And this is what Monument Valley looks like. Mm -hmm. and if you've ever seen a John Wayne Western, you've probably oh, seen Stage Monument Coach. Valley. Stagecoach. Perfect. It's, it, if anybody wonders about why people were attracted to Westerns, they can watch Stagecoach and find out. It's well, a wonderful if, movie. If, if you look at some of these movies, you would think that the whole West looks like this, and it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, what do you have for a title? Arizona Department of Transportation wants you to suggest sites for EV charging stations. Makes that sense makes to sense. me. The Arizona Department of Trans Tr Transportation has an interactive map 
that gives EV enthusiasts a chance to express their views on where EV chargers should be installed. It's only good for Arizona, though. It, yes, it's only, I was going to say that. If you want to <laughs> install one in Vermont, they're not going to take you seriously. As pioneers of new technology and many EV drivers know a lot more about such things. Well, that's true. Um, as the state officials do. That's true, yeah. The Department of Transportation has people running it, cut from the same smart cloth, who know the value of citizen input. Yes, well, that's a fortunate thing, yeah. Because when they, when they don't find out what people want and then try to give it to, you know, something to people, they usually Well, if you want to see what Arizona's charging corridor looks like, it's on the uh, website. It's on the website, <laughs> that's right. Okay. And we've got a picture here. This is of a space the launch, launch of a SpaceX, and um, this is from Clean Tactica. And, and frankly, I find this story distressing. Why is that, George? Well, because Elon Musk is behind this, and it's you know I think of Elon Musk as a person who's trying to solve pollution problems instead of create them. But what do you got? Climate damage caused by growing space tourism needs urgent mitigation. Right. And space tourism is only just starting, really. That's right. Researchers from UCL, the University of, um, of Cambridge. University College London. Yes. Thank you. And MIT, which is Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's what they call it. I knew that. <laughs> I was right. Used a 3D model to explore the impact of rocket launches and re-entry and the impact of projected space tourism. The damage done by space launches was shown to be almost incredibly polluting. Well, that's what they're saying. This is only just starting. It's only just starting. A formidable space, tour indus space tourism industry may have greater climate effect than the aviation industry. Yes. That's heavy. An undue repair to the protective ozone layer if left unregulated. Yeah. I have seen uh, a video someplace it's many months ago about people who were trying to develop ways of launching satellites that use no fossil fuels. Okay. But they're not... They haven't been able to do it, huh? Well, I think, they're, I think they've got plans that might actually work. They're on the are You're not going to put human beings in these things because they're, they're oh, okay. they, the, the stresses that are produced are too, difficult. Too much for people. Yeah, huh? well, they'd be much too much for people. Well, the study allows us to enter the new area of space tourism. Yep. With our eyes wide open to the potential impacts. That's right. It does. Okay, we, nice we have a this, picture this, here like of picture. Patagonia. I like that picture. I like this picture, too. And I was looking at all kinds of pictures of Patagonia, and I would say this is not atypical of them. There, there are a lot of pictures of dramatic mountains, and it's, well, it's just, a beautiful area. This is area. a particularly good picture of it, yes. Okay, this well, is from Maine Biz. Now... We had the Indian Express talking about Germany, and we had France 24 talking about Germany, and now we've got main biz talking about talking Patagonia. About pa Patagonia. <laughs> well, Portland Renewable Energy Firm, that's Portland, Maine. Not Portland, Patagonia. Right. <laughs> to install a power system at the other end of the world. That's right. Ocean Renewable Power Company, based in Portland, Maine, is a developer of renewable power systems that generate electricity from river and tidal currents. That's it. it they, they use the current to generate the and electricity. And guess what? That Not, picture has a river right in it. It does. <laughs> it plans to install a new power system more than 6,400 miles from Maine next year in Chile. It's uh, happening in Chile, in Patagonia. Yeah. Well, Chico, which is the name of the town is interested in expanding its use of renewable energy. In the next few years, the municipality plans to expand electric vehicle charging networks and tourist traveler services, adding a public lighting in off-grid areas of the community and create additional electrical capacity to support community development. They're getting on the ball. Yes, they are. This is the same organization that we've seen before installing systems in Alaska and so forth. 
That's uh, ORPC. Yeah. Yeah, right. They have, they, they've been up in Alaska for a long time. Yeah, they have been. Well, their river, their RIV gen power system replaces diesel generation systems with highly predictable baseload renewable, renewable energy power systems. Right. So they're getting rid of diesel and they're putting in Hydro, renewables. But it's it, the, the important thing about this hydro is there is no dam. No, right, right. There's it's, no dam. No, it's, just, it's run just of the river. Run of the river. And so they they don't have to, for example, block salmon runs and things gonna, like that. I'm going to pull it up again if I can. I can. What there you, you know? go. Pretty river. Yes, yeah, nice. Well, that's that's where the river starts right in that picture. It starts the right The river in, begins, yeah. Okay. I mean, the lakes are there. Yes. Okay, but the river, it starts as a river at that location. Okay. Okay, we got some nice-looking lettuce here. Yes, and this is... Um, a woman is watering them. That's right. This is from the BBC. Fertilizer shortage. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hits African farmers battling a food crisis. See, this is, this is more of the Ukraine thing. Fertilizer, the key ingredient needed to help crops grow, is in short supply globally. Global prices have skyrocketed in part because of the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. The crisis has left many African countries, which are very dependent on foreign imports, scrambling to find solutions. Well, the amount of fertilizer available has almost halved. Yeah. The cost of some types of fertilizer have tripled. Yeah. So there's a problem here. Yeah. Africa, which already uses the least amount of fertilizer per acre in the world, is at high risk. Cereal production in 2022 will decline 20% below 2021. I think, honestly, honestly, I think... Now, cereal doesn't mean Cheerios. Yeah. What were you saying, honestly, when I saw... I, I was going to say, I think Putin is um, delighted. Well, I hope he isn't, but I think you're right. You know, maybe maybe he isn't, and if that's the case, then... Well, I'll... Tanzania, like many other African countries, relies on fertilizer from Russia and China, which are the two leading global manufacturers. Russia produces large amounts of potash, ammonia, and urea, which are three of the key ingredients needed to make chemical fertilizer. And Russia exports about 20% of the world's nitrogen fertilizers. So this is significant. Russia is in the catbird seat there. Absolutely. By the way, did you know why potash is called potash? I probably did, but I've forgotten. <laughs> it's <laughs> derived from ashes that you find in a pot. <laughs> I thought it was from potassium. Maybe potassium, potassium came backwards. Yeah, it came backwards. Potassium came from potash. Okay. But it's it's pot the ash. pot. It's the ash in the pot from joints. No. <laughs> From burning wood. Well, while I, while I say absurd things like that, let's look at a picture of an electric ferry. Well, let's do that. I think this is an interesting picture. This is, very, this is a crazy very, picture. Very interesting picture, and this, really. And this ferry, they're, they're going ahead with it. It's going to be, it's going to be in operation carrying um, uh, uh, customers uh, this is from Clean Technica. Well, that's what they say. Uh, first of all, you can see the pontoons underneath that it's resting on. Yeah. Okay, so that, that tells you already it's fast. Yes. Okay. Sleek electric ferry flies over water, and it picks off diesel ferries. Yeah. If all goes according to plan, commuters in Stockholm will be able to climb aboard the world's fastest electric ship. I don't believe for a minute that that thing is a ship. I'm sorry. <laughs> the the uh, Candela P-12 shuttle, when all goes into service in the suburb of um, Ekero, uh to the city center next year, Candela is already well known for its sporty looking electric boats. Well, this boat has... It can hit 30 knots. That's almost 35 miles an hour. That's, that's fast. That's fast, yeah. That's almost three times faster than the normal 12-knot limit in Stockholm's waterways. Okay, which they limited because the uh, wash from the... The wake? The wake. Yeah. It's da extremely it's damaging. damaging. That's been doing unbelievable damage in Venice. 
Well, this electric ferry will shave 25 minutes from the current 55 one way, 55 minute one way commute. <laughs> so it's <laughs> it's okay. The P12 yep. will undergo a nine month trial period in Stockholm, and if it performs according to expectations, it, it Candela. The company is already looking to repl beyond replacing Stockholm's entire diesel fleet. Okay. So we're up to Wednesday, June 29th. On we Friday. are. And now we have that article that you referred to that was yeah. in Clean Technica, which I wrote. And by the way, it's had close to 10,000 views in three days. Yeah, it's, I got the initials GH here. You wrote it. That's you right. did a good job, by the way. That's Thank good. you very much. Well, it's the estimated cost of generation resources in the late 2020s. And it's interesting because it, the cheapest is new near-firm offshore wind. And you're going to tell us what near-firm is. I am indeed. But why don't you read the title and we'll go from there. Uh-huh. I know the title. I remember it. Here it is. It. Here it is. <laughs> we don't need baseload power. Right, and I was not kidding when I chose that title. Baseload power often supplies electricity in the middle of the night, but we can use power from other sources instead. The issue is not technical. It's just a matter of cost. Because of, lo because of low battery costs, our electricity can be cheaper and better. We can use them, save money, and have a better system. We can use renewables to save money and have that's, a better system. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. And basically, if you look at this graph, the top two items on it are near-firm onshore wind. That's the cheapest. And new near-firm onshore wind and new near-firm solar. Cheapest too. What, means, uh, what near-firm means is that... It's, at, it's almost absolute. Yes, it, it behaves approximately the way dispatchable um, energy does during the, the important times of day. It does not mean that you're going to be able to carry this through the night, uh -huh. every night. But if you combine... That's why they call it near firm. Yeah, that's firm. right. It, but if you combine solar and wind, you don't have to go very much farther to get through every night. It's interesting and, that the most expensive item on here is nuclear. Yes, and another thing, too, I should mention is that this graphic that we've got came from Next Era Energy. Next Era is a big energy company. It's their data that they, they did the analysis. This is their supplied analysis that they are giving to their stockholders to explain why they're spending money the way they are. Okay. And Next Era... Uh, is the biggest investor in, in renewable energy in the United States. Is it really? It also owns seven nuclear reactors. Wow. So, and one of them is Seabrook. Okay. So these people, you know, yeah, have some got... Some Seabrook power goes into Vermont. Some of it does. We get 10% of our power from Seabrook, roughly. But basically what's happening is if you look at this and you see... Existing natural gas, nuclear, and coal are all more expensive than near-firm solar and wind. So that means you could tear down coal, nuclear, and, and gas-powered plants and replace them with, with new near-firm solar and wind and save, save money, money doing it. Well, baseload power may supply the electricity in the middle of the night, but power from other sources as you just mentioned, yeah. could be used instead. The issue is not technical. It's just a matter of cost. It's just a matter of cost. Now, it happens that um, Rick Perry, who was the governor of Texas and, and was... The former the, secretary of the Department of Energy. Right. Said we need near form... Near we form need baseload power. Baseload power. And he said that Miracle almost the same time that wrong. Next <laughs> Era published this thing. And it's so obvious from that graph that Rick Perry is wrong. You know. Well, the article says if something came along that could provide the electricity cheaper and better, we would use it instead and save money. That's right. And your spoiler to it is <laughs> something has. <laughs> and by the way, I'm right now, um, the, the CEO of uh, Clean Technica asked me to follow this up with another article. Oh, good. 
It was um, a good show, good article. I'm, I enjoyed writing it. It was not an easy thing to, to write. I spent quite a few hours on this one. I believe it. Just making sure that I'd ha I had it the way I wanted it. But he wanted me to write an article on a study that uh, Mark Jacobson has produced. Mark Jacobson is an engineering professor at uh, Stanford. And Mark Jacobson has done this over and over again. Each time he kind of makes it bigger and better. He did a study on 145 countries to show how each one of them could get to 100% renewable energy and save a lot of money and buy now a lot of money. That's Say that again. <laughs> Each one of them can get to 100% to renewable energy and save, and a, save lot a lot of money. Of money. And so why are they still... <laughs> well, it's not just saving money. They would have better, electri uh, more resilient, more stable uh, grid. electric grid. They would have a cheaper electric grid. They would ha uh, have no pollution to speak of coming out of power plants. And as a result of that, they'd save literally trillions of dollars a year on medical uh, stuff. And they but would be... plants that they've already paid for and are trying to get their money back. That's part of it. Yeah. yeah. People are, are afraid to walk away from... You know, a coal burning plant that they built ten years ago. Exactly, uh, it's a it's a uh, stranded asset. They don't yeah. want to lose it. You know, and it's people are just they. But, they, so but you know, I was thinking that costs money. Yeah, I was thinking of getting a big button that says "Save the World?" Question mark. What's in it for me? Question mark. <laughs> Should we go on? Tom? Yeah, we got a picture of an Airbus coming up. We here. do let's, indeed. Let's get that that, that Airbus. This is an people, interesting airplane. People can look at it. They describe that thing somewhere in the article. That's a neat looking plane. It is. It's not very big though. It looks bigger than. Well, it's bigger than than you might get might get from that building because the whole plane is 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 seats. full of seats. Now, to give you an idea of how big it is. Uh, you can see that it's got a door on the side, and the door is there to for yeah, okay. human beings to go in and out. But um, that's you know, it's not a it's not like a commercial plane that has a door and is that length, because as you pointed out, the whole thing the whole is is, is, is full like of seats. Ten, ten seats across. There, or yeah, I don't know how many people would fit in that, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, astounded if you said a hundred. You know. Well. Green hydrogen is in play for the Airbus hydrogen hub scheme. This was a little bit confusing to me. Yep, this is from Clean Technica. Airbus has just signed an agreement with a global industrial gas firm, Linde, to help, and that is L-I-N-D-E, to help carry out a plan to develop hydrogen hubs at airports around the world. There are different ways to bring this about, including some that are entirely free of all polluting emissions. Well, hydrogen... It's not 100% clean bourbon because of nitrogen oxides. So if the air actually burns. Yeah, if you, if you, there are different ways of dealing with hydrogen. And one of them is to burn it in a combustion engine, in which case... In which you, case you get some nitrogen oxide. Another oxygen. one is to put it through a, through a um, fuel Electrolyzer. cell. A fuel cell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can use you it in a fuel cell. Results. You get a very different result. It's clean, much cleaner. It's much cleaner. And, um, well, that's what it says. I'm just going to say this. Yeah. Hydrogen only emits trace amounts, trace amounts of carbon dioxide when combusted. Yes. When hydrogen is used in a fuel cell, there are no airborne emissions at all. Yeah. Water is the only byproduct. That's right. And um, it doesn't have to be hydrogen. That's another thing. It can be ammonia. Okay. Because you can put ammonia through a fuel cell, too. And if you do that... And you that, can store it easier than you can store hydrogen. It's a whole hydrogen. lot easier than storing... Well, it's liquid. Hydrogen. It's a liquid. You get to store hydrogen, you've got to keep it pretty cold. Yeah, it's pretty close to absolute zero. That's pretty cold. It's pretty cold, yeah. Colder <laughs> than Brattleboro in January, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, have, you ever seen the, have you ever seen the thing of taking... And this isn't liquid hydrogen. This is liquid nitrogen, where they, they take a fish and they put it in the... It's swimming around, they put it in the thing... No. Two fish. They'll put two fish in. They'll put the two fish. They'll put one fish down on a table and the other one back in the tank. Mm -hmm. and then they hit the one on the table with a hammer and it shatters like glass. <laughs> wow. The one in the tank. It's still swimming. Wakes up and starts yeah, swimming, yeah. swimming around. One of these days I'll tell you the story about 
about um, uh, an experience that I had with liquid nitrogen, which was just the weirdest thing. If I put it into a science fiction movie, it would be called too hokey. <laughs> okay, well, we Airbus should... is seeking more sustainable so sourcing for hydrogen. Yeah. And is zeroing in on green hydrogen for renewable resources. So they use solar panels or wind to yeah. produce the hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. Our last um, article was one that I said was coming up where in which the Europeans were, were stepping up. We've got a picture here that I know when I first looked at it on my screen. I couldn't see any of those uh, <laughs> the, the, those turbines. I couldn't see any of them at all. Yeah. I had it make the, the picture lighter so I could see them yeah. increase the contrast. This is from PV Tech. What do you got for a title? European Council reaches agreement on its renewable energy directive. Now you're going to tell us what that means. Right. The European Council agreed to a set to set a new binding EU-wide target of 40% of energy coming from renewable sources in the overall energy mix by 2030. That's, that's not even eight years away. But it's still pretty conservative. Yeah. Up from the previous 32% target, energy production and use amounted for 75% of uh, the EU's emissions, according to the European Council. Well, accelerating renewable deployment is the only path to energy security and a means of reducing reliance on Russian gas imports. Okay, so whether they like to or not, the economic community's got to go yeah. renewables. Well, that's the end of it, Tom. Should I tell that story about liquid nitrogen? Uh, let's see, accelerating renewables. <laughs> I've said this already, yes. Tell I used us. to work in a plant where they made t uh, phosphor phosphorescent and, and fluorescent pigments. Yeah. They had a test room, which was a black room. So if you stay in that room too, too long, you glow. No, but <laughs> the, the testing was done in a room where the walls were black, the ceiling was black, the floor was black, the machinery was all black. There was no light on during the tests. Okay. <laughs> so what do you see anything by? Well, it happened that there were luminescent dials that would give results. So everything came from these luminescent dials. Well, when you've been in there for a few minutes, you start to see the technician walking around because he's wearing a white lab coat. Yeah. Okay. So they had a problem where they would, they had to cool something really fast. And the way they did that was by putting about a teaspoon of liquid nitrogen on it. Oh, yeah? And then the liquid nitrogen would spatter and it would fall on the floor. And then it would race around on the floor like water <laughs> on a red hot pan. <laughs> But what it would do is it would condense all of the, of the water vapor that was below, say, waste level. So you'd, have a, you'd be in a black room with luminescent dials, and that's all you could see except for the lab technician. And all of a sudden, you start seeing this, this kind of fog come up. And it goes around like this, and the lab technician goes, and the fog is moving. I'll tell you. It must was, be bizarre. Oh, it was the most bizarre thing you could possibly imagine. <laughs> but it was real. <laughs> it actually <laughs> happened. Okay, we are at the end of we our time. We have finished, yes. And we have so. a thing that says, have an agreeably wonderful week. It would be very nasty to have a disagreeably <laughs> wonderful week. I think so. Week. I think so. I think you're right. Why don't you put us up, Tom, and we'll wave goodbye. Why don't I see if I can't do Well, that? why don't you do that? I'm going to You got the wrong. There, there you go. There There's go. your cursor. There's us. us there. And now we're up. Adios, amigos. You all come back here. Did I get it right? No. <laughs> you all come back and see us now, you hear? You all come back and see us now, you hear? <laughs> <laughs>